for any value of the, a force of applied force that is bigger than f maximum m1 will necessarily slide now to see an application of Newton's third law which we have not used yet let us uh, think about the case when the force is bigger than f maximum with m1 and m2 but now m1 and m2 do not accelerate together M1 has one acceleration and M2 has a different acceleration. And that's, as we said, is because the applied force F is bigger than the maximum value calculated previously. Because of that, M1 is sliding on M2, is not able to keep up with M2, which means that with respect to M2, M1 is moving towards the back. The question that I want to solve is what is the acceleration of M1 and what is the acceleration of M2 in this case? The first question about the acceleration of uh, M1 is, is easy because we said that the block is sliding which means that we have kinetic friction between 1 and 2. The direction of this kinetic friction once again should be opposite to the direction in which 1 moves with respect to 2. In what direction is block M1 moving with respect to M2? If you're standing on M2, block M1 moves to the left. So that means that the direction of the kinetic friction should be to the right. Just in the, as in the case of the tablecloth and the glass of wine, as you remember, as you're pulling on the tablecloth, the glass of wine experiences a force to the right, which is a uh, force that accelerates the wine glass uh, towards the edge of the table. So a free body diagram for M1 would show the normal force that 2 puts on 1. We've done this free body diagram before, so I'm just going to do it very quickly, M1G. And here is the kinetic force that 2 puts on 1. So in the x direction, the only force acting is the kinetic friction. Kinetic friction, therefore, is the force responsible for accelerating the block 1 to the right. Kinetic friction has a constant value of mu sub k times the normal. And since in the vertical direction there is no acceleration, the normal force should be equal to the weight. So we can replace for n to 1 m1g, cancel m1, and obtain that the acceleration of block m1 is going to be mu sub k times g. Alright, so let's do acceleration 2, the acceleration of block number 2. So what are the forces acting on m2? Let's do a free body diagram showing all of those forces. So here's M2, M2 has a weight, M2 has a normal force with the floor, M2 has the normal force because of M1 being on top of it, so this is the normal force that 1 puts on 2, we have the force F to the right, and the direction of the force of friction should be to the left, since on M1 we determine that the force of kinetic friction that 2 puts on 1 was to the right then it is necessarily true that the kinetic force that 1 puts on 2 should be pointing to the left because these two forces constitute an interaction pair which means that Newton's third law applies to these two forces they must be opposite in uh, direction and equal in magnitude so let's translate the free body diagram into equations. In the x direction, we have force F minus kinetic friction of 1 and 2. And that's it. That should be equal to M2 times the acceleration 2. In the y direction, we have the normal with the floor. Negative, we have the normal force that 1 puts on 2. And negative also the weight of M2. And that should be equal to zero, since M2 is not going up or down. 
Now to figure out the acceleration of block number two, which is what we're looking for, we need to figure out what is the kinetic friction between one and two. And this is where we use Newton's third law, because the kinetic friction that one puts on two in magnitude should be equal to the kinetic friction that two puts on one. What is the value of the kinetic friction that two puts on one? Well, according to our equation, that should be equal to mu sub k times the normal force 2 on 1. So we can see that, so this means that kinetic force that 1 puts on 2 should be equal to mu sub k times normal force that 2 puts on 1, which is m1g, so mu sub k m1g. So now we know that this force circled is mu sub k m1g. So we can replace that in this equation. Replace that with mu sub k m1g. So the acceleration is equal to f divided by m2 minus mu sub k m1 over m2 times g. And that's the final answer for the acceleration of block 2. Now let's, as usual, we need to check whether this answer makes sense or not. First check would be to see what happens when mu sub k is equal to 0. That means when there is no frictional force between m1 and m2. How should the acceleration of 2 be in that case? Well, if there's no friction between m1 and m2, in the horizontal direction, m2 does not uh, feel the effect of m1. It's like m1 doesn't exist, really. m1 stays in place, and m2 accelerates because of the force F applied. So it makes sense that, in that case, the acceleration of m2 should be equal to F divided by m2. When there is friction, the equation is telling us that the acceleration of 2 is going to be less than when there is no friction. That again makes sense. This minus sign guarantees that m2 would slow down whenever you put a mass m1 on top of it. Other, other checks that you can perform on this equation is to see the case when m1 is, for example, equal to 0. One more time, if um, instead of being a block, M1 is just a very small piece of paper, the acceleration that you expect for M2 is obviously unaffected by the presence of this small little piece of paper. So it should be F divided by M2. So this equation in all of these tests seem to give uh, reasonable results, which means that we can be confident that we have arrived at the correct answer for the acceleration of block 2 as a function of the mass m1, m2, the applied force, and the coefficient of friction between the two blocks.